All right, we're at Fringe Coffee. We got some coffee. Hmm. Looks like they're going to be teaching us some things. Quite nice. Lovely pond, huh? Farm advisors help the farmers grow quality coffee. The uh, and then once we harvest, the, the, the uh, post harvest is managed by us. And then we go out and we roast or sell the coffee, and with over 50% of the revenues going back to the farmer. Stephen, we just dip when you got here. In case you recently visited another coffee growing area and transporting fungal spores. So we're doing everything we can to try to get the coffee. Syrup, you know, lemongrass, taste to it. So when I'm roasting this, I want to bring that out, not so much add flavor to it, because it's one of those that doesn't need a lot of flavor added. Now, when I when I say adding flavor, I mean in, in roasting, the darker you go, you're adding sugar, you're caramelizing flavors, those darker roasts, even the very dark roasts that you see almost are oily and, and you know, leave with you when you touch it a little bit of oil. Now, a roaster will do it to that dark to add an amount of sugars or, or caramel flavors. And so with a lot of our varieties that you'll see, we do more lighter roasts because the truth is, is we're just, we're trying to give our customers and anyone trying it what it already has in it. We don't want to add too much flavor to any of our varieties because they really are very fruit forward. They're uh, flower forward. This is how we pick it too, like what it looks like mm -hmm. inside here. Put in the some coffee, cherry thing. I'm going to eat coffee, I'm not going to be drinking it. <coughs> okay, let's try this thing. I was going to wait for the coffee. Oh, should I wait for the coffee? I don't know. <coughs> I'm just thinking. I think people are eating it. Let's try it. Oh god, is it going to be? There's two beans in there. So what do you think? What flavors are you getting from the cherry? Wow. Sweet, sour, acid. You shot it. There's no right or wrong answer. There's a little coffee bean in there. Who'd have thought? That's cool. How is that? I don't know what I taste. Very delicate. Obviously lemon. Yeah. What I love, Marina, is, you know, it's not harsh, and it's a great afternoon coffee. All right. I just wanted us to gather here before we descend into, once again, the first coffee farm in the continental U.S. Meters from your feet. All right. So we're about to descend into the coffee. I'll guide you on a path. It's um, Just watch your step. Go slow. Yep. So these are, we are in our peak harvest season right now. So all these beautiful burgundy fruits are all hand picked. So we have a team of five farm laborers here on this farm, harvest everything. We make about five passes on each tree. So we in specialty coffee producers, we want to only harvest the darkest red ripest fruit. The highest sugar content is going to provide the best fermentation, the most variety of flavors. So it's a very skilled labor activity because you come in and you can see that all the fruit um, on each branch is not necessarily all ripe at the same time. So it's a constant decision-making process. And so I'm really proud of our guys who do a really great job because they know that it begins with the harvesting. Only the ripest fruit will make the best coffee. So, um, these trees in this section are all labeled. There's wooden signs that talk about the different varieties. So this is all Arabica coffee, but within Arabica coffee, there are many different varieties. So as you walk down here and take a look around, think about how there's each plant of a different variety has a little different shape. So the leaves, some of them are more green. Some of them have copper tips. Some of them, um, the leaves are bigger. Um, these lighter green leaves are the new flush for this year. So this is all the new growth that has happened this year. 
You'll also notice that there's flower buds on all these coffee trees. So being so far north, it gives us a unique opportunity to have, this is one of the only places in the world where you'll all have ripe fruit and flowers on simultaneously. So most coffee producing regions in the world have a time between flowering and fruit of about six to eight months. So you would usually not have flowers and fruit on at the same time. Our advantage of having such a long maturation cycle because we are so far north is that it gives that much more time for the seed to develop, which means more flavor. So it's a slow process where we can, the plant can slowly give many nutrients to the fruit. And so it makes it even more sweet. So it's really a special thing that, um, like I said, you won't, if you visit another coffee farm in a different country, you probably will not see this phenomena. Do you have to do anything to the soil or do anything to, to <clears throat> enable this? Yeah. So the question was, what do we do? Do we have to do anything to the soil? So yes. So coffee is not a plant in California. We can just stick it in the ground and it grows. They actually, it's quite involved process. So we put dry fertilizer around them. We mulch a lot. We, um, we uh, provide nutrition through the irrigation. So we have liquid fertilizer that we inject to them. Um, coffee also requires a lot of pruning. So to regenerate that wood. So there's a lot of work that goes into it. So just keep that in mind next time you're drinking a cup of coffee that uh, all the different things that you learn on this tour all go into producing that cup. What's this thing on the fall here? That's a little weather station. Yeah, we're working with a professor, uh, Cynthia Fizori at Whittier College, and she's doing a long-term uh, study on uh, climates in different coffee farms. So we have a weather station here and a few of our other farms, and she's, she's seeing how uh, the coffee uh, sort of mediates the environmental temperatures in these different farms. So we're going to continue down. Are these grapes growing down? Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, is a self-pollinating plant, so it does not require bees or other insects to produce fruit. That being said, the thought is that having bee pollination does help increase your fruit yields. So we are going to have another bloom here in about a week, and it's going to be bees everywhere, um, going to smell like jasmine in the air. Um, their coffee is a perfect coffee is a perfect uh, flower, meaning that there's both male and female parts on the flower. It's not all fruits are like that. I mean, flowers are like that. Some are only male. Like cherimoya, there's male flowers and there's female flowers. So that that requires uh, cross pollination. Do you guys struggle with any invasive species? Yeah, the question about invasive species. So we do have. We are an organic farm, so we have quite a lot of weeds. Um, most of the weeds are manageable. There's one called Gara that we really dislike. It's uh, rhizomatic, it's really hard to get out. Um, so yeah, that's our biggest struggle right now is the Gara. So if you know any way to effectively control Gara, please tell me. So, <laughs> there are, it's a constant constant battle, but having weeds and ground cover is, is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, you want it to stay away from the root zone of the coffee. So you don't want the weeds to, like say for this plant right here in front of me, if there were weeds right here, it would be competing with the coffee for the nutrients, but that's not good. But if there were some sort of vegetation growing on the soil in between, it's actually good because having the ground covered provides a temperature buffer. So when it's really hot and you have ground cover, then it's uh, going to uh, buffer the temperature, so it's not too, not quite as hot. And even one or two degrees really can make a big difference in these, uh, you know, very hot days. So uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, pruning, the way we manage the coffee plant. So if you look at this coffee plant right here, you'll see that on each branch there are, there's, it becomes woody as it matures. You get. So you'll have an apical, which is the vertical one. This is what makes it taller. Off of the apical, you have laterals coming. And off of those laterals, you have sublaterals. So coffee will 
flour and fruit on these laterals and the sublaterals, but it only happens once in each spot on it. So as the tree ages, you'll have fruit in, you know, starting close to the node, and the next year farther out, and the next year farther out. But as, as time goes on, it gets a bit tired. It's a lot of work supporting all this fruit, all this sugar, and transporting. So you have to regenerate the plant. Coffee rootstocks can provide vigorous growth for 25 years, but each shoot or apical will leave it for five years or so. So this one is a very good shape. Um, you can see there's still a decent amount of fruit on it. So I'd probably let this one go for another year, but we're thinking about what's next. So we don't want to let it go for too long like this because it will decline in productivity. So what we do after every harvest season is we'll come in, spread apart these laterals and look for a, uh, a new apical forming off of that, um, off of this one. Like this one? So yeah, so this one, so exactly. So this one was pruned this last year. It was pruned a little late, so we're gonna be out of production for this plant for one for one year. But next year it will be this tall, and it will fruit and have uh, flower and have fruit the following year. <clears throat> so we're constantly regenerating. We want to have one shoot that's in production and one shoot that is growing vegetatively, so that when we take off this main one, we'll have another one at the ready. So it's like a rock and roll cycle, they call it. If you go on YouTube and you look up coffee pruning, there's a bunch of different styles of it. Some of it depends on the varieties, but um, that's the style that we go with here. Griffin, how many harvests do you get out per year? So the question was, how many harvests do we get per year? So we make about five passes on each tree over the year. So as you might have noticed on each coffee tree, you'll have some... Um, on any given branch, you would generally have some fruit that is less mature and some fruit that is mature. So our guys are going through and they harvest the deep burgundy ones like this. And then in a month, then they'll come back to this tree and harvest these green ones will have matured by then. Well, like in avocados, we do size pick. Okay. Yours mm -hmm. is almost like a color pick. Yeah, so we have a color pick. So um, we don't pick by size. We, uh, we do size grade the coffee uh, in the post-harvest side, so, but that's after we have pulped it. Um, you're going to learn about all the post-harvest, so this will all make sense, but after the pulping, after the fermentation, after the drying, after the milling, when it's green coffee, right before it's roasted, then we'll do a size grade because you want to roast things that are generally about the same size so that they roast evenly. Yeah. If you, so look at the, I want, to, I want you to focus on the differences between the varieties in terms of plant architecture. So what I'm pointing at right now is a Catuai Rojo. This is a cross between Catura and Mundo Novo, which is from Brazil. Catuai Rojo is one of our favorite ones because it's a very productive plant and we can use it in blending with other varieties. If you go to my right, you'll see Larina. Remember the one I made you on the pour over? Yeah. I said it looked like a Christmas tree. Or bon bon two. Think about pointed leaves, very narrow. So it's a single point mutation mm. in the genome which causes this. Very dense. So this is the this is the Lorena plant. There's a uh, there's one flower on this right now. It, like it smells like jasmine. So I really encourage you if you see any coffee flowers, please smell them. They are so amazingly aromatic. Sun-grown coffee. So, in California, we have lots and lots of sun, generally. The clouds, are, the marine layer is burning off right now. It's going to be a nice, beautiful, warm day. You may have heard about shade-grown coffee, and that's a the idea that these coffee orchards, plantations in the, you know, there's, there's a lot of other overstory trees that are going to provide shade. So coffee is natively an understory tree in Ethiopia, where it's native to. So there's always a balance in agricultural systems between you want some shade because it buffers the environment, but you don't want too much shade because it's going to reduce the photosynthesis of the plant and you won't get as much fruit. So in uh, the most productive systems will be full sun coffee, 
because you get all of that sugar generation, just a lot more fruit on it. But it's it's very uh, it pushes a plant very hard. So you do want some amount of shade so that the plant um, can you know it's a bit more um, the plant can rest a bit more. It buffers it from the wind. It buffers it from the cold. You'll get the leaf litter. Like this avocado tree is a, next to this coffee is a good example that the leaf litter from the avocados will fall into the ground and then it will incorporate into the soil. But it's not necessarily underneath it, it's next to it. So, so we have a mostly sunny system with some <laughs> shade. And so for most of our growers, we're trying to encourage them to plant those Inga trees because it gives some shade, it gives wind protection, uh, nutrition. But um, so yeah, some, there's always a balance between that. Does that answer? <laughs> Arabica coffee that was found in Ethiopia from a town I cannot pronounce this in the correct dialect, but it's it's like a G E S H A. It's like Gesha or something, and um, it's this variety that was found from there that is um, not as pretty as the other ones, in my opinion. It's more sparse. You don't have as much uh, full of a canopy, but you and you also get a little lower production, but the fruit tastes very good and the coffee yields it's a very delicate cup of coffee so it's a very smooth jasmine florally cup of coffee uh, it was brought to panama where it was grown there um, and there people really discovered its amazing flavor and they started having these auctions of it so every year the maximum price paid for the geisha coffee keeps going up. So two years ago, it was about a thousand dollars a pound for a hundred pounds. This last year, it was like thirteen hundred dollars per pound. So who knows what it's going to be? These are small lots that are being sold relative to the total output of these farms. So there'll be one hundred pounds, heavily selected, only the best, zero defect geisha. But it's just an amazing. It's an amazing cup of coffee. So we are fortunate enough to have geisha genetics here. This is fringe is really pushing the geisha because it's the most profitable one for the farmer and it's delicious. Um, so yeah, if you'd like, feel free to come sample some of these geisha cherries. They're, um, there's a little bit of sunburn on them, but they're still very delicious. <laughs> We have more geisha cherries harvested over here, so if you don't get any right now, don't worry, you're going to try it. Integral part of the experience. <laughs> So they look pretty different, right? They taste warm. They taste pretty different. Kind of peachy. Oh wow. Wow. Yeah. Uh, importers will try to find them. They'll get some success. But it's um, it's not the easiest. <laughs> seen fruit on this tree. So this is the thing is that you look at it, it's a beautiful tree. The leaves are perfect. Uh, it's got great vegetation, but there's not that much coffee on it. So being a farmer, you have to make money. You have to have fruit to sell. So there's this is, this is kind of the opposite extreme of the full sun where you'll have entirely full shade. And if you plant it in this way, it would, your plants would be very, um, uh, nice and green with big leaves, but you would not get as much coffee off of it. Also one of the reasons why these leaves are so much bigger is because the plant needs to have more photosynthetic area because it's thinking, oh, I'm not getting enough sun right now, so I have to make my solar panels even bigger. So so it's uh, it's really needs a little bit more. Which variety is that? So this is a uh, Kachura. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but really, room here. All right, so this is our coffee drying room. You guys can pile in, or pile in, come in here um, if you're comfortable. So
so we dry our coffee on these raised beds. This is very common uh, technique in Africa. Uh, in other parts of the world, like Central America and Brazil, they generally have these big patios where they'll spread the coffee on the floor. Um, it's nicer to do them on the raised beds because you get better airflow, so the drying is more homogeneous. So every one of these cells is a different lot of coffee, so very, very small lots that we're doing. Uh, I mean, some of them are bigger, so this one's sitting at three. A very small lot. People talk about nano lots, this could be like a pico lot or whatever. So coffee needs to dry evenly. So multiple times a day we come and we move the coffee around so that surfaces are all exposed at some point and it will dry evenly. We dry it to about 11% moisture content. So there's this little, can somebody pass me that black little device right there? So this is a uh, agtronics, very common in the coffee world. This is how we measure moisture content. So every day going in, measuring the moisture content. Um, so in, you know, origin countries, people, this is some people's entire job to just work on the coffee mill or coffee, um, what do you call it? The beneficio in Spanish, they call it. Uh, just stir coffee. And it seems like a very simple thing. It is pretty simple to move it around, but it's a very integral part of the, uh, the experience. Because if you have, if you don't stir it, you'll have some parts that are dry and some parts that are wet. Then when you go to bag it, it will all homogenize. And if the ones that are over 11% will, um, more water activity, more opportunity for spoilage and mold to go on. So we really need to get it dry enough to where it, um, uh, stable. So this is 18.9% right here. Not quite ready. It's also weather dependent, so it's not so straightforward. So obviously it dries quicker on hotter days and slower on cooler days. So you can manipulate. Uh, if it's going to be a really humid day, as we had earlier, there's a lot of moisture because of the marine layer. We can slow down things by, we can pile it all together so that it's less affected by all that excess humidity. And then when, it, when the sun comes out, like right now, you come in here, you spread it all out. So yeah, feel free, touch it, um, don't just it. don't mix it. Um, but yeah, it's a very, it's, I find this incredibly soothing to touch it. I love the sound of it. I love the texture. Um, so this is the parchment coffee. So it's how this, it's been pulped. The fruit is obviously taken off of it. It's gone through the fermentation. It's been washed. So it's all nice and clean. And all it has is this husk on the green beans. So we have a machine after this that takes off that husk and the chaff, they call it, and if you scrape that off, you'll see that on the inside, there is, it's like a gray green seed. So, and if you look really closely, there's actually a little radical or root in there. So this could be planted and in nature, it would fall off the tree, germinate on the soil and get a new coffee plant. The lineage continues, but here, this is the green that we sort and is going to be roasted and turns into coffee you drink. So, yes. Everybody's wondering how it gets from the cherry to this stage. Yeah. Really Let's do that. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Hi, everyone. Great. So again, I'm Alex. I'm our post-harvest manager here at Fringe. So I'm primarily involved in everything after the coffee cherries are picked up until they're roasted. So as we'll talk about, it's a multi, multi, multi-phase process uh, before it's before it's brewed and, and consumed and enjoyed. Um, so you just saw the coffee growing. Um, after it's harvested, the big question is how does this the seed inside this cherry end up in your, in your morning cup of coffee. Um, so traditionally, there are primarily three different ways to process coffee after it's harvested. We have anyone that knows those three primary ways. Can we name them? Anybody feeling? Washed. Washed. We can go with that. Absolutely. One of three. Two more. Natural. There we go. One more. I think I heard it. Honey. Awesome. Awesome. So, uh, Wet processed or a washed fermentation, which is what we primarily use here. Touch on that in a little bit. 
then there's a honey process. No actual honey involved. It's just um, talking about the color of the of the parchment. And then a, a full natural process. So we'll start there. That's the easiest to explain. Um, you basically just take the cherries and you dry them out on, on either raised beds or even on the floor, depending on what country you're in. Um, and that's a, that's a two to three week process. So um, typically natural process coffees are, are very fruity. Um, they have a heavier mouthfeel. So we talk about mouthfeel in coffee. If you've had a glass of non-fat milk versus whole milk, whole milk is thick and creamy. The non-fat is kind of watery. So for coffee, a natural might have a, a thicker, heavier feel in your mouth. Some people love it. Some people don't. Um, it's really personal preference. So again, natural is just drying the cherries directly from the tree out on some raised beds. Um, then we switch down to a honey processed coffee. Um, so that then you are removing the, the pulp from around the seed um, with a, a mechanical mill. So you would actually run it through this. Uh, this mill, and, and we'll get a little demo of that in a minute here, um, to remove the pulp, and then the seeds pop out. But the seeds still have a, a layer of carbohydrate and pectin and sugar, and this is then dried at this point. Um, again, another two to three week process, ideally. They're slimy, um, and each of these processes have a, a different, they result in a different cup profile. We talk about cup profiles in coffee, so the tasting notes, how it smells, um, all of that. So um, there are even variations of the honey process, a red honey, a black honey, um, and it's all in reference to essentially how much pulp you do or don't remove from the seed, all depending on what your ultimate goal is with that particular coffee. Um, and then the final process is a wet fermentation process that we use here. So like the honey, you run the coffee through a wet mill, um, but then you ferment the coffee for anywhere from 36 to 72 hours uh, to remove that layer of carbohydrate. And in doing so, you, you get a coffee that's really clean and crisp in the cup. Um, from our initial research with California coffee, we found that wet fermentation seems to do the best. I personally love natural processed coffees from like Ethiopia, so I'm hoping we get to experiment with that at some point. Um, the yeast, you, so you have this, these, slimy, these slimy seeds, right? And so the, the yeast then eat away at that, that slime. And, and if the fermentation performs well, um, the seed actually feels like sandpaper. It's coarse in your hand. Um, you could do that. You could rub every seed together by hand. That's tremendously labor intensive. You would never do that. So we let the yeast do that for us. Um, so that was a fire hose of information. Any questions briefly on those three general ways to process coffee? Um, can you explain how the honey, how the honey works with it? Yeah, yeah. So the honey is the, is the hybrid between the two. So the full natural and the wet fermentation. So the honey, you still remove the pulp from the seed, but you leave that layer of carbohydrate around the seed. So it's, it's still slimy. Um, if you were doing a full fermentation, the yeast then removes that layer. So again, it's all depending on what ultimately you want that coffee to taste like at the end. Um, and then, the, like I said, there's a red honey, there's a black honey, and that all refers to, depending on how you calibrate the mill, more or less of the pulp is removed, and then that then affects flavor down the line when you brew it. Um, great question. Do you get as particular about the yeast you use? We do, yes. So we use a strain um, developed by Scott Laboratories um, that we find works well for most of our varietals. We are experimenting with a couple other strains this season, actually. Um, so stay tuned on that. Uh, I hope we get to a point where we say this particular varietal from this farm with this yeast performs the best. So that's the direction we're moving in. We just need some more data points to get there. Um, so yeah, great, great question. But just, just one strain for all of the coffees you've tasted today. Um, sweet. So wet fermentation. So coffee cherries come in. We would then float them in buckets in, in this sink here. So we float them. Um, we let what we call floaters rise to the top. And that's typically an indicator of a, a poorly developed or an underdeveloped seed inside. So we immediately scoop those off, 
that's defect coffee. We don't want that for specialty grade. Um, we actually just received some new equipment in San Diego this week that would mechanically float coffee cherries for us, which is amazing. It's going to streamline so much of our work. It's going to float them and then feed them directly into the hopper. So especially as we grow, as we hopefully have thousands of pounds coming in every week, that's going to be a huge, a huge um, boost for us. So right now we float in a sink and scoop off the defect, and then we start loading them into the hopper. So I don't have that today. We just have a small little run of, um, I think you saw these earlier on the table. This was our Katura, Gesha, Lorena. Um, we typically wouldn't blend those, but special blend for you today on the tour. Um, so we'll pretend these have been floated. Yeah, go for it. How long do they that's the drying. The floating is just a couple minutes. You, oh, it. Yeah, it's just to see what floats and what sinks. You scoop off the floaters. We'll work through it a few times to make sure floaters aren't trapped on the bottom. Um, yeah. Like the sandwich trial. Yeah, you, <laughs> perfect, perfect. <laughs> That's what I was missing. Thank you. There we go. Um, awesome. So then, then we feed the cherries into the hopper. The, uh, the pulp comes out here, and at that point we call it the cascara, or cascara. Um, it's a byproduct, technically, in, in the process, but there are lots of different um, ways that we, can, that we can reuse it. So we can dry it, turn it into a flour, you can dry it, brew it as a tea, kind of tastes like pomegranate. Um, lots of potential uses. Right now it's just compost back for the farm, uh, which is never a bad thing either. Uh, and then the good seed comes out here. And it goes directly into uh, these fermentation vessels. So they're essentially repurposed five-gallon buckets. We have different sizes inside. Um, and then at that point, we would begin the inoculation with the yeast, um, again, for three to four days, depending on, depending on the varietal and depending on some other, some other variables. So um, does anyone want to help me feed some cherries into this and get a quick little run? All right, Chris. Chris is on it today. Let's go. So, a um, couple things. So, this, this piece of equipment is uh, made by a company called Penagos from Colombia. Um, it's very old technology, but with a little love and care, it gets the job done. Um, so, it has a, a breastplate. Uh, we have different sizes, and you calibrate it depending on the size of the cherry. Um, typically, we would need more than, than just this to calibrate it for a full production run, so we won't get into that today, but um, that's part of the nuance of the process normally. And uh, I, think we'll, I think we'll go from there. So it'll be a little noisy. I mean, you can hear it now. If, if folks want to come over underneath the tree to be able to yeah, see what's going on, on in here, come over here, it's going to be... It might actually be easier to come this way, I think. It'll be a fairly quick process. This is just a few pounds, so... Seven ready? Demo, demo, demo? All right, let's go. Here we go. All right. Chris, he's, he's hired on Monday. <laughs> sure. I'll start tomorrow. Perfect. He's here tomorrow, Sunday. There we go. Keep going. Awesome. Hey, Chris. Yeah. You can see the, the bolt starts to come out here. A big production run, and, and check the calibration. So we see we're getting we're getting a little bit of good seed out the back. There's always some loss in production, but I would probably go ahead and tighten tighten the breastplate down a little bit. Oops, excuse me on that. My boss is calling me. And uh, and then we would we would tighten and readjust it and keep going. So then in the in the fermenter, we then get the seed comes out here. And as you can see, there are a few cherries that slip in. So again, we'll make some adjustments, tighten that up. And, and go from there. So this is all slimy. You're welcome to come up and feel it. Um, again, at this point, if we wanted to make a honey, we would stop here and take this out to dry. But for us, again, we found that a wet fermentation typically does the best. So we would get some yeast out, inoculate, and then on the table there, we have a little demo for you. This farm, uh, this is our Pacas varietal. 
Uh, so we use different size fermenters depending on um, how much seed we have. So we try to optimize the the, the head space so, um, between the seed and the upper um, and the lid area. So as you can see, the yeast is very happy. It's just about 24 hours. It's bubbling away. I'm happy when I see that. When I don't see that, I'm not happy. So great that the yeast is doing that. Um, it gets stirred every day. It's a temperature, humidity controlled um, chamber in there. Try to keep it around 68 degrees with some airflow. And uh, I will go ahead and open this up so you can smell it. And then we'll put it back to sleep. Um, I will give it a quick rinse. And then that um, coffee is then laid out to dry in the drying room. I think you probably saw the drying room mm -hmm. on the tour. Awesome. So you saw that. Um, the goal there is a gradual decline in moisture content over two to three weeks. So the seed will start at around 55% moisture. We want to dry that slowly down to about 9 or 10%. Um, there are lots of different ways to slow and accelerate that process. And, um, and then that then is called parchment coffee. So now it looks at quick glance like some peanuts. And um, that is then cured for about three to four months. Uh, it sits in reposo, which just means rest, um, and then it actually is milled again, and that spits out the green bean that's prepared for roasting. Um, but it doesn't stop there. There's lots of sorting by hand, size grading, looking for defects. Um, so I say that every bean is touched many times, and that's usually no exaggeration, so especially at this scale. Um, and, then, and then we brew it and enjoy. So... Any any questions on any of that? You're that are, uh, we have a grower in Moore Park that has. Um, uh, his name is. His name is uh, Burns, John Burns. Yeah. Um, so hopefully everybody got a good chance to try fruit. See what that coffee is actually a fruit. We learned about fermentation, which is usually something we like to get wine and beer. Um, and then the brewing and all the different flavors from the geishas, the larinas out there, all the possibilities. Um, so uh, that is one of the successes of trying to do these types of educational experiences. Um, we couldn't do it without the team. I do have um, enjoy that. Um, and try a little bit of the two coffees. I know you're probably at your max caffeine level here. <laughs> you the Saturday coffee tours, get a little jittery. Tell you. Hey, thanks for watching this video. This is my dog, Murphy. And these are dog treats. Now I'll give Murphy one of these dog treats. And all you have to do is press the like button. Just press that little like button right down there at the bottom of this video. And this sweet, adorable, cute little puppy gets a treat. All thanks to you. All right, you did it? Okay, I believe you. You said you did it. There you go, Murph. She got that treat because of you. Now, I'll eat one of these treats, and all you have to do is click that subscribe button. Right there, pointing to it. Just click that subscribe button. Subscribe to curiosity -ness with me, Travis DeRose. Get lots of good video, and I'll eat this treat. All right, you did that too? That's not very good. We're not very good.